when are you going to stop telling disabled jokes? I said, when they find a bloody cure. <laughs> Steady Eddie was born with cerebral palsy. To most people, this debilitating condition means a life of personal and social restrictions. Five hours, Mr. Eddie. Oh. Better get a move on. But Steady Eddie has turned his disability into an advantage. 30 minutes, Mr. Eddie. Righto. Oh, hang on, wait. Many out there? Yeah, they're lining up all the way around the block tonight. Oh, great. Should do okay tonight. Armed with only a sense of humour, Steady Eddie has supported himself in every top-line comedy venue in the country. Hey, sir, what to buy a pen, sir, 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 please, pen. This is his story. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the man who can't. <laughs> The Sydney Comedy Store proudly presents the Batman of Comedy himself, Mr. Steady Eddie. Please. <laughs> oh, God. I love being a spastic. <laughs> Let's face it, it's got its advantages. I can always get a seat on the bus. <laughs> or I can even get a, you know, car space at the local shopping centre. As if you bastards haven't taken it already. <laughs> but the best thing about being disabled is I can go to a party, sit on one beer all night and still look like I've had a great time. <laughs> but I tell you, there are a few disadvantages of being disabled like trying to get medical insurance. <laughs> I walked into this medical insurance office the other day and said, listen, mate, I need some medical coverage. He said, sorry, son, you've got a pre-existing condition. <laughs> I said, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> sure. I said, you've got two choices here. You overcover me. Or well, three of them mates are coming around with baseball bats and giving you a pre-existing condition. <laughs> he covered me in the highest bracket. <laughs> of course he would. <laughs> now, if I'm ever hit by a truck, I'll be a total vegetable. <laughs> but unless I'm covered, eh? <laughs> Oh, God. The advan I tell you, there's a few other advantages of being famous as well. You get to, you get invited to all these great places like the snow. I got, in yeah, got invited to a chalet and I decided to go skiing. <laughs> <laughs> at, Mal at Mal Krakenbach. <laughs> The ski instructor looked at me and said, there's two basic rules of skiing. Keep your knees bent and wait forward. <laughs> I was a bloody genius, honey. 
and I had this, but there are, are some disadvantages. I've got to tell you, because I should be a millionaire at the moment. After all, I taught Michael Jackson how to dance. <laughs> and Joe Cocker. <laughs> Actually, we made Joe Cocker our honorary spastic. <laughs> I said, so Joe, how do you feel about this prestige honour? He looked at me and went, ah, ah. <laughs> Actually, Joe and I went to the same speech therapist together. <laughs> Lucky it worked for me, eh? <laughs> I also had a, a sporting career. I, I got into it quite heavily. And I eventually went to the, um, the Olympics this year, last year. Saved myself there, didn't I? <laughs> Did you know Elton John sang the theme song? I'm still standing. <laughs> I got some really great events, though, like the hop, skip, and trip. <laughs> The slip discus. <laughs> Synchronised swimming for epileptics. <laughs> but my personal favourite, right, is a wheelchair long jump. Because <laughs> I'm the guy that stands at the end of the runway and shoves a stick in their spokes as they go past. <laughs> I got back to Australia, right? I had to appear on TV. And um, TV done, has done wonders for my career. I sold twice as many pens on the weekend. <laughs> I mean, at this rate, I'll have enough money to buy a new wheelchair with bumper stickers, <laughs> like my other wheelchair is a wheelchair. <laughs> or bumper stickers like, I'd rather be walking. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe wheelies make better lovers, because <laughs> they just keep on pushing. <laughs> Actually, I was making love to this girl in a wheelchair the other day. <laughs> we started at Surface Paradise. <laughs> we ended up at Bondo Beach. <laughs> Stupid bitch forgot to put the brakes on. <laughs> I also love going to parties. It's really great bumping into old friends. <laughs> we even have our own party games, like hide and wait. <laughs> Pin the artificial limb on the donkey. <laughs> or maybe snakes and ramps. I was at this party one night and a guy came up to me and said, mate, I'll bet you 200 bucks you can't beat me at this game. I said, son, don't even try. No one ever beats me at Twister. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one party I went to was a beach party. Well, it was more like a bloody safari. <laughs> Have you ever tried to dig a wheelchair out of sand? <laughs> With nothing more than a walking stick? I mean, one guy we had to leave there overnight. 
came back the next day and he won first prize in his sandcastle competition. <laughs> But I've got to tell you, when I was at school, I was a real mongrel. I, I was, can you tell? <laughs> I used to do all these awful things like hide my mate's artificial leg. <laughs> Gee, did you get hopping mad? <laughs> Actually, this guy, this guy with the artificial leg and myself went to this Japanese restaurant one night. And you know, traditional Japanese restaurants, you've got to take your shoes off. <laughs> <laughs> now, for my mate to take his shoe off, has to take his whole leg off. <laughs> so here's him going, and here's me going. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and after dinner, he leaned over to me and said, hey, steady. This isn't as expensive as I thought. And it cost me a leg. <laughs> and my teachers, my teachers were the best. They used to say, steady, you're disabled. Very intelligent, they were. <laughs> they said, you've got to be inconspicuous to fit into the mainstream of society. Every morning, a bus would come to pick me up with spastics in a written down song. A lot of comedians say they started out being the class clown. Is, is that true of you? Uh, I think so, yeah. St Paul's Infants was a, a pretty tough special school. You needed a sense of humour just to survive. Every, every lunchtime you'd be lined up at the canteen uh, waiting for your prune sandwich and then bang, it'll be on. There was wheelchairs flying everywhere, you know, there'd be calipers whizzing past your ears and the, pu and the pupils weren't much, much better, you know. Yeah, this, is, this is probably a bit naughty of me, but um, Edward was a bit of a teacher's pet. Really? Yeah. Oh, we used to love to take him shopping. You could leave him in the car and he could bark at strangers. Ah. Thank you, dear. Another teacher's pet, I'm afraid. Goody one-shoes, we call her. Mink. The teachers used to treat us like total idiots. You would get the school certificate if you could tie your own shoelace. And their idea of a geography lesson was showing us where the toilets were. And for a history exam, they would ask us what if we could remember what we did yesterday. But apart from that? Uh, well, apart from that, they did teach us the three R's, reading, writing and ridicule. Did you strike up any friendships in your time there? I tried to, but it was, you know, pretty difficult. I felt alienated. I, I just didn't fit in. In what way? Well, it was a girls' school for a start. Mm. And I, I kept on getting the cane for everything. If something went wrong, I would get the cane. I remember once the school staff room burnt down. I even got the cane for that. Well, you, you're saying you were victimised? Oh, no, no, not at all. Oh, I did it. I just enjoyed getting the cane. Of course, Steady Edward is a very special case. He has uh, sharp intelligence and tremendous drive. Fortunately, nowadays, both of these conditions can be treated. His underlying condition, however, is a little more difficult to treat. In what way? Well, he has an inability to accept the fact that he's ill at all. He has delusions that he can lead a normal life. Now, of course, the reality is that he's severely handicapped or physically challenged, as the government like us to say. And no matter how sensitive one is in trying to impress upon him 
the severity of his disabilities. It just seems to fall on stony ground, as the good book says. I've said to him, I've said, look in the mirror. You have cerebral palsy. But <laughs> he just gets angry and behaves like a total spastic. I remember when he first came to see me, his referral described him as a difficult case, but according to his family, his heart was in the right place. I gave him the usual once over and discovered a few interesting abnormalities, but uh, other than that, he seemed quite normal, well, apart from a very slow reflex time. I gave him the usual tests, blood, urine, but I was convinced from the beginning that Edward's real problem was primarily psychological. He seemed to harbour a deep mistrust of the medical profession. But of course, that's, uh, that's all water under the bridge now. Since then, he's made enormous strides, uh, metaphorically speaking. And we're all convinced that it's just a matter of time before he realises he's not a comics asshole, and he's back in the sheltered workshop where he belongs. I've got to ask you a question. Have you ever noticed that traffic lights, when you see a special bus, that everyone in it is going like this? <laughs> We do it on purpose. <laughs> Just to piss you guys off. I mean, when you're not looking, we sit up straight and suck back the dribble. <laughs> uh, I've got to tell you this, I, I don't like admitting this, but up until a year ago, I, I used to be in a pretty tough, a really tough gang. <laughs> we were called the West Side Wobblers. <laughs> Man, we were tough. How tough, I'll tell you how tough. We used, hey mate, we used to give up our bus seats for young fit people. <laughs> We were so tough, we wore our baseball caps around the right way. <laughs> we were so tough, we could sit through an entire record of George Smilovich's. <laughs> we were so tough, we were, hey, how tough, I'll tell you how tough. We saw pens at roadside accidents. <laughs> It was a great way to recruit new members. <laughs> and every Saturday night, we get dressed up in our gang's uniform, black leather dribble bib, <laughs> and matching stovepipe calipers. Oh, darling, you better believe it. <laughs> and we head off down to the local milk bar. We were that tough. We shook our own milkshakes. <laughs> and then after a few stiff, thick shakes, I won't be saying that again. <laughs> it was time to head off downtown to meet our arch rivals. The vicious, bloodthirsty, neo-Nazi East Bankstown Junior Blind Society. <laughs> Man, they were tough. <laughs> Mate, their guide dogs were pit bull terriers. <laughs> so tough they used to gangbang lampposts. <laughs> but I eventually had to leave the gang, 
because I broke the unspoken code. The reason it was unspoken was because <laughs> no one could pronounce it. <laughs> it was <laughs> so I still don't know what it was. <laughs> To, I've got a few, I've got to tell you here, I've got a few members of my family in the audience tonight and it, it's been very difficult because my mother's blind, my father's deaf, I'm cerebral palsy, my sister, well, she's the only black sheep of the family. <laughs> she was completely normal. <laughs> we had to put her in a home. And my grandmother, she was an epileptic. God, she made good chocolate cakes. <laughs> and my great, 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 great grandfather actually came out here on the first fleet. Convict Steadwood Edward. transported for stealing an artificial leg. <laughs> Gee, he was a good pink pocket. <laughs> he would have got away with it too, but he left his artificial hand in the guy's back pocket. What was your home life like? I guess I was pretty lucky, really. I mean, most children don't remember their first steps. I do. It, it was 2.30 on the 6th of February last year. And my mother was really proud. She's starting me on potty training next year. You must be looking forward to that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I am. I mean, Mum's always had a really great sense of humour. I mean, she used to play lullabies to me on a drum kit. Were you a difficult birth? No, no, I don't think so. Although I was premature. In fact, I was nine months premature. Really? Yeah, when I was coming out, the other spoons were still going in. Well, Steady was always a bit slow, especially with his schooling. I mean, most days by the time he walked to school, it was time to come back home again. And by the time he got home, it, it was time to go back to school. Couldn't he have caught the special bus? Well, there was no point, really. The school's just over there. I mean, he spent most of his days at the front gate trying to open it. So we never saw him much. They were the happiest years of my life. What was he like in his formative years? Formative years? Hmm. He hasn't had any yet. Uh, no, no, I mean, what was he like as a child? Oh, well, he was a very solitary child. He didn't mix much with the other children. And um, why was that, do you think? Well, we used to lock him in his shed. But he seemed happy enough. I mean, we just give him a steak and kidney pie in his straw. And he'd entertain himself for hours. So when did you first realise he had this wonderful talent for comedy? Comedy? He's doing comedy. Yeah, yes, he's making a very good career out of it. How can he do comedy? He's a cripple. He certainly doesn't get it from my side of the family. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on to me love life, because I've I, I got to talk about this. <laughs> yeah, I, I tell you, since I appeared on TV, I have been getting a lot of letters. Mind you, most of them being from Social Security. <laughs> <laughs> but 
they want my pension back. <laughs> but the others have been concerned about my love life. Now, I've got a very high-powered sex drive. I just need someone else to work the gear stick. <laughs> and you've heard of the missionary position? <laughs> missionary. <laughs> and what special school are you from? <laughs> Most people use the mission, missionary style. Not me, mate. I use a stationary position. <laughs> I had one woman come up to me one night and say, what are you like in bed? I said, well, I'll tell you the story of the hare and the tortoise, how the hare does everything really fast, and the tortoise takes it slow and steady and wins the race. She went home with me bloody tortoise. <laughs> and what's even worse, she said it's the best route she's ever had. <laughs> but I've got to be honest, I did have a couple of long-term relationships. And I had one with a beautiful girl named Lucy. But it turned out she was going out with me to get an easy car space at the supermarket. <laughs> And then I was going out with a girl called Fiona, but um, she was only after me for my body. <laughs> she was training to be a mortician. <laughs> uh, so I thought, right now I've got to improve my sex life here. So I read the Kama Sutra. <laughs> no good to me. I get in those positions just trying to put my socks on. <laughs> so, since I've been back in town, I've been going out a lot. Got a, yeah, toward the trendy nightclubs. And um, the other night, I actually won the dance competition. Funny thing was, I wasn't even entered. <laughs> I was on my way to the bar. <laughs> this girl came up to me and said, um, would you like to come back to my place for a bit of sex? I said, oh, righty, eh? <laughs> Got to the moment of truth, she said, do you wear condoms? I said, nah. I hate the smell of burning rubber. <laughs> uh, oh, come on, come on. I believe in safe sex and condoms and everything, but I don't actually wear them, because I come three times before I get the bloody thing on. <laughs> and I love foreplay. One, two, three, four, ready! <laughs> But it is actually hard for me to find a girl that actually suits me. No. Oh, another genius in the audience. <laughs> yeah, it is. I see a beautiful girl walking down the street, and I think to myself, if only she had a limp. <laughs> do when I'm finished with them anyway. You talk a lot about your love life on stage. How close to the truth is that? <laughs> well, most comics exaggerate on their sex life for, for comic effect. I do the complete opposite. I mean, most people's first sexual experience was in the back of a car. Mine was in the back of an ambulance. I mean, the nurse asked me to take a temperature. 
It, it's the first time I've ever seen a thermometer with batteries. <coughs> Have you ever been in love? The, there was one girl once. But it's, it's too difficult to talk about. I mean, I think some things aren't meant to work out. I still keep a picture of it. No, no, that's not her. There's a social worker that's bonking me at the moment. My only real love was a girl called Lucy. Her hair hung like mist on the crest of a mountain. She danced through my heart. Like a soft summer breeze With her in my arms I could burn in the sunlight Stand proud in her beauty As tall as a tree Like soft blowing embers, I glowed in her smile. Her voice was like music, the sword from a whisper. She played in my mind like an innocent. Cerebral palsy affect your day-to-day -day life? Well, my day starts just like anyone else's. It, it just takes me a bit, bit more time to, to do things you take for granted, like eating, w walking, showering, dressing, talking, <laughs> even breathing. It's like I've got two bodies. My left side is, is slower than my right. It's as if my right side went to metric and my left side said, screw you, buddy, I'm staying imperial. Uh, I'm actually the slowest part of Eddie's body, which is really lucky because his right hand gets all the hard work. Well, I'm the only part of Eddie's body that isn't bent. Well, I do have a slight bias to the left, but then so does the rest of his body, yes. See, the main problem for me is one of communication with the brain. For example, very often when Eddie sees an attractive woman, he's just as likely to get a stiff arm and leave me to hail the cab. Well, of course, my job is incredibly demanding. I mean, normal shadows just have to move like this, very fluid and graceful. But when Eddie moves, I, I have to bang on this sort of, well, creature from the Black Lagoon sort of thing. I mean, it really is most ungainly. It was a lot easier when he was bedridden. You know, of course, if one were Joe Cocker's shadow, one would expect this sort of thing, but, I mean, this chap is completely demented. Oh, God, here he comes again. 
I went up to Queensland. And while I was up there, I did a charity gig for the house with no steps. <laughs> they, they were raising money for a bus with no wheels. <laughs> I flew up there on the plane with no wings. <laughs> it was a very bumpy ride, man. We had the pilot with no license. <laughs> but there was one good aspect of the trip. I got the hostie with no morals. <laughs> up there, I decided to book myself into a hell farm. <laughs> Didn't do much good, did it? <laughs> like, I wanted to give up smoking. Not because I was scared of lung cancer. Nah. I was just scared, sick of burning myself in the air. <laughs> I mean, it, it was really disgusting, I tell you. I was up to 40 smokes a day. Mind you, I dropped 30 of them. <laughs> and I wanted to change other things about my life, like my eating habits. Just for starters, I wanted to get more of it in my mouth. <laughs> and up there, I couldn't believe it. There's no eggs, there's no milk, there's no sugar. There's no, no, none of the good stuff. No alcohol, no cigarettes. I was bloody dirty, mate. How <laughs> dirty? Like, even James Scott lost in the Himalayas got two bloody chocolate bars. <laughs> <laughs> and all they would feed you is tofu. Have you ever tasted this shit? <laughs> Tofu crepes, tofu rissoles, tofu Mexican style. <laughs> and on Sunday, oh, big treat, we had baked tofu <laughs> and Yorkshire tofu <laughs> and tofu. <laughs> things to really piss you off. Like wake you up at six in the morning and be happy. <laughs> like someone would, you know, a nice frizzy little blonde bimbo come in and go, hello, how are you? It's like, <laughs> And one of their morning rituals, right? was to ever give everyone a great big hug. Piss off. <laughs> I don't want to be up at six in the morning, let alone giving some fat shell a hug. <laughs> and then they would really piss you off. They would take you on, how much, mate? They would take you on a brisk one kilometre walk. before breakfast. <laughs> anyway, after lunch, when I got back. <laughs> it was time for aqua aerobic. <laughs> they got fit, <laughs> I got mouth to mouth. <laughs> I'll talk about the video for a minute because it's going to be released in Australia but also in America because um, I've just got a two-year contract with Warner Brothers and I'm leaving in March. <laughs> yeah, I've got a contract as a stunt double. <laughs> 
for the Thunderbirds. <laughs> Working for Eddie. Well, it's a bit of a nightmare, really. I mean, comedy's a pretty serious business. And when it gets down to it, there's basically only seven cerebral palsy jokes, including the silly walk. So I've told him, you know, I've told him straight, I said, if he wants to kick on in this game, he's going to have to uh, do a Madonna and keep reinventing his image, you know, get, a, get a new disease every three months. But he won't listen. You know. It's a pity, really, because I've got some great stuff on cholera and uh, leprosy. I've done leprosy, and I've got a drawer full of polio jokes. You know. How did the chicken cross the road? That was one of mine. Uh, but, uh, no, I don't want you to get me wrong. I mean, I, I love the guy. I love him like a brother, you know. I mean, he's good to me. I mean, he, he let me have this office and uh, I'll get free pens. Um, he even loaned me his typewriter. Um, it's not what I'm used to, of course. I'm used to, uh, to better things. But, um, yeah, I manage with this. I can't do any jokes with Q in it, but... I manage, you know. But it does get hard, you know. You can spend weeks writing a bit, refining it, editing it, or editing it, as we have to say around here. And you do all that and you realise it's a complete waste of time because uh, you see, you can't read. It was hopeless, you can't read at all. It's like, what's this word, Wally? <laughs> this dog, you know, dog, I say. But it's no good. Hopeless. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I, I manage, you know, but you know, but I have to teach him everything, well, virtually parrot fashion. It's where I sit him on my shoulder and tell him the jokes. It's one of mine too. So, it's been a long association. No, not really. It just seems that way. I wonder if you can remember the first piece you ever wrote for him. I was hoping you wouldn't bring that up, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a TV bit, a ventriloquist bit he wanted to do. Eddie the Bent Bent, he wanted to call himself. It was hopeless. It was just hopeless. I mean, apart from the fact that ventriloquist has a cue in it, right, Eddie can't even talk properly when he's allowed to move his lips. He doesn't move his lips. So, Archie, have you got a joke for the nice people? I don't know. How many? That's really funny, Archie. Now, Archie and I would like to sing a song for you, and it's called Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Poker Top Bikini. And at the very same time, I will attempt to drink a glass of water. She are in Itsy Bitsy It was a nightmare. It's the first time I've ever seen a dummy walk out on a vent. Hey, where are you going? Why do you still write for him? Pays me off his pension. Speaking about coppers here, I was going down the highway the other day doing 180 in the 60 zone, and I got pulled up by this highway patrolman. And you know, highway patrolmen are complete and utter imbeciles. They are, it's a well documented fact. So this copper, he walks up to me in his big tough voice and he goes, Excuse me, son, you mind stepping out of that wheelchair? <laughs> Yeah, sure, what's your name? Jesus? <laughs> I, I tell you, 
like, I've known most of the staff here for quite a while now, and they're all worried about me because they think I'm turning into a bit of an alcoholic because I'm always buying schooners. But that's so I can have a midi when I get back to my table. <laughs> and like, they've been trying to educate me, right? They've taken me to different places. They took me to the horse races the other day, but I would only bet on the handicapped horses. <laughs> Well, I figured they needed all the help they could get. <laughs> Have you um, heard the latest with the government? I, I just remembered this, that they've introduced the anti-discrimination bill for disabled people. Now, normally, politics doesn't interest me, because last time I tried to join the Nazi party, <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate, they threw me out after two weeks. Couldn't get salute right. <laughs> but it now means I can go for all those jobs that I've wanted, like shorthand typist, <laughs> and race caller, and they're rough and racing, and oh, they're finished. <laughs> And I've always wanted to be the first disabled person on the moon. You might call it a space astronaut. <laughs> one small step for man, one giant limp for mankind. <laughs> or I could even be the captain of the USS Eddie Prize. <laughs> and it's five year mission to boldly go where no veggie has gone before. <laughs> now you think about this, somewhere in the universe, there is a planet entirely populated of disabled aliens. They call it the planet with no steps. <laughs> I think, think about it though. Why is it that all UFO sightings happen within a 500 kilometre radius of a shorter workshop. <laughs> All right, I admit it, I'm an alien. <laughs> From the planet Vegemite. You know me as Steady Eddie, but my real name is... <laughs> but I know, I know what you're thinking. I do. You're thinking this guy on stage is full of shit. <laughs> He's not an alien at all. <laughs> but I can prove to you disabled people are in fact aliens. Remember Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Right, ship comes down on the mountain. What's the first thing that comes out? A ramp. <laughs> yeah, I had a few jobs before comedy. One of my first jobs was on a dairy farm. Every time they wanted fresh butter, they would get me to, to, to milk the cow. And then they put me on to chicken plucking. I enjoyed that. I really liked chickens. I was up to one and a half chickens a week before I got the sack. Well, why, why were you saying? Well, no one told me you had to strangle them first. <laughs> well, would you know you had to strangle them first? No. Ah. And then they put me on the shearing sheep. Did you enjoy that? I didn't get a chance to find out, did I? By the time I strangled my first sheep, it was running me off the property with a bloody shotgun. So then it was back to the big smoke. I got a job with the local council for a while. Did I 
night. And then I got a job in a hardware shop. Eddie, yeah, we had him working here for a while. Yeah, you know, doing a few bits around the place. Ladders go out the back. You idiot. Yeah, we was making cups of teas and cleaning up, you know. Shame I had to let him go. So why did you? Well, I had no choice, really. We couldn't get him into the union. Whenever we had a vote, by the time he got his hands in the end, the dispute was over. Pity, really. Came in really handy when the paint shaker broke down. That yarn event's a good sword, eh? So what does the future hold for Steady Eddie? Well, we're going into the merchandising side of things and bringing out a range of toys for, for children. Hey, you got the stuff, Jim? Yeah, yeah. And remember when you were young and you had a nice fluffy teddy bear and, and that sort of toys and that? Well, we've actually brought out the steady bear. And I mean, this, this is just great, you know. It's, uh, kids love this. I mean, you, you, just perfect. And any other ideas? Well, we're bringing out a range of adult board games and uh, our latest one is called Monotony and it's only got one square, so no matter what you roll on the dice, mm. you always end up, <coughs> that's enough, at the sheltered workshop collecting your $200 pension and without passing go. Right. Well, I... Uh, Personally, I'm working on a version of charades for disabled people. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really easy as well. It, there's only ever one film, and that's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Oh. We've, um, we've seen what Madonna's done with the, the sex book, and I have heard it on the grapevine that um, Steady Eddie is thinking of moving into the adult only market. Any, any truth in this? <laughs> Oh, God. Go on, yeah, go on. Yeah. Well, I can't say too much, but what I can say is that I've had some lengthy discussions with one of Australia's leading photographers. Hmm. How have you become involved in the project? I've wanted to photograph Eddie since the first time I saw him. I mean, such a challenge. I mean, even in real life, he looks out of focus. Jesus, have a look at those. But the um, the more I saw him, the more I realised that he was, you know, unique. Such magnificent bone structure, such unpretentious naivety, such uh, unself consciousness, and uh, and poise. You know, as an artist, you know, I'm always looking for people with that special something, that uh, indefinable quality that uh, leaps out at you and seduces you through the lens. Yeah, well, what can I say? I mean, the first time I saw Nettie naked, I realised. I realised exactly what Picasso was getting at. You're, uh, you're not famous, are you? Um, Listen, no. uh, any time you uh, want to photograph, uh, you know, any time you like, just say, give us a call. Except Fridays and Saturdays, cos uh, I'm working the restaurants, you see. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Nice shot. Yeah, yeah, nice. Uh, I've been going around to um, different places lately, as I said before, and I walked into um, Westfields the other day, and I saw the um, disabled parking, disabled car spaces, you know, disabled ramps. But I got to the fire escapes, And you bastards put stairs. <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> I'll tell you, but in my younger days, my favourite thing was I used to go to the entertainment centre and borrow my mate's wheelchair. Because let's face it, he always got the best seat in the house. And you could always tell the Christians at the concert, because they started screaming miracle 
when I got up to take a piss. <laughs> got to go now because um, the nursing home's closing shortly. <laughs> so remember, whatever you do in your life, no matter how far you go, if you can't be straight as possible, be bent like me. again. Stand up straight.
want a two bar answering thing. Or a one bar thing. Maybe you seem happy enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> okay, no, it's time to go. Do the steady bench, it's easy to move. Do the steady heavy, it's easy to move. Uh, which is answering uh, alternative bars. It was a very solitary choice. It didn't mix much. Just back up, just back up. I, yeah, I'd like another shot at that because we're just we're uh, doing two bars there. Two. So we so we take two bars and then you take two bars and then I take two bars. And... Pity, really. Came in really handy when the paint shaker broke down. Isn't that dear an inch of again? You've bared yourself to the world, both body and soul. How would you like to be remembered? I'd like to think I've given disabled people a, a sense of their own worth. And if there's any message in, in what I do, it's that any disabled person can realise their full potential if they want it bad enough. And do you think you've been successful so far? <laughs> well, put it this way, when I first met Professor Stephen Hawking, he was a struggling nightclub singer. <laughs>